episode of Cross Border Conversation, a Stir original video series that features professionals from across geographical boundaries and varied creative disciplines. The format is very simple as we invite a guest to converse with each other and share moments of revelation, each other's professional life journeys, anecdotes and stories, experiences and inspirations. We watch them inspire us. At Stir, we strive to cut across various creative disciplines and one such discipline, which we all passionate about is automotive design. The adrenal gush that we experience by riding a machine that has marveled an amazing cocktail of engineering, technology and design. Today on this very subject, Stir is very proud to have two guests in conversation who have been passionately invested for years in that very adrenal gush of automotive design and the experiences that goes along with it. One of them who says, and I quote him, playing it safe is the biggest obstacle for progress. The ultimate vocation of arts and creativity. No risk means no change. No change means predictability. And that is said by none other than Frank Stephenson, who's joining us today in this conversation. Welcome, Frank. Good morning. Thank you for having me here. For Frank, blending art with science, with latest technology, with taking care of our environment as has been a key. The four pillars of his design philosophies are biomimicry, innovation, environment, and technology. Title is one of the most important and influential car designers working today. Frank's design range from high, has, has designed range of cars from high concept, hypercars such as a $1.1 million McLaren P1 and Maserati MC12. With more than three decades of experience, Frank, to his credit, has marquees such as Mini, Ferrari, Maserati, P8500, Alfa Romeo, to name a few. A journey for re from reimagining London taxi cabs, bespoke military watches, he's embarked today on a much more futuristic mission as he sets out to create the Lilium Jet, an electrical vertical takeoff and landing aircraft for 2025. We all wait to watch that happen and be sure it's going to happen in its own glory. Frank was born in Casablanca before growing up in Spain prior to moving to California from college. His career has, been, has seen him work all around the world. He now resides near Henley on Thames in UK. Away from design, Frank lies nothing more than riding his motorbike. Some interesting anecdotes on him. As a teenager, he was a motor, motocross racer, frequently finishing in top 10 international level, level racing. It was his father who insisted him to find something he can be the best at and that's how automotive design found its way in his life. Welcome, Frank. With Frank in conversation with a professional who always believed in pushing her own bar, who set new benchmarks, and who never says no if somebody turns around and tells her that's impossible. That's Gul Panag, ladies and gentlemen, a certified pilot, an automobile influencer, adventurer, biker, actor, aviator, and an entrepreneur who's one of India's most influential opinion maker and a thought leader. She's a frontline advocate and activist, an adrenaline junkie who loves the great outdoors and adventure sport. Gul is also has accomplished off-road off-roader whose travelogue spans the elegant fashion capitals of Milan, London, and New York. An icon for women's fitness, she co-founded Movie Fit, which is a technology company that makes fitness apps across multiple disciplines. Passionate about technology and automobile, Gul has been on juries of various forums that evaluate the best in class for each, including various automobile and technology awards. She's extremely fierce, and that's what she's known as when it comes to challenges. You tell her that she can't do something, and the next you see her and her coming in full force to make sure that challenge is met. There's an interesting story which Gul shared with us. She and her husband, Vishy, who's as much an adrenaline junkie that post the wedding, the couple along with the family is all groomed off on a Royal Enfield bike, which was seen unlike in any typical Indian wedding. And Gul is today completing her own, her law degree. Welcome, Gul. We couldn't find a better pair for Frank which, uh, when, when we talked to Frank and Gul to come on cross for a conversation. One who's, both of them were passionate about this energy of design innovation and technology, which helps us run through that adrenal gush. Welcome, both of you. Thank you, Amit. That's very, very kind of you to say those wonderful things. Thank you. 
All I can say is, wow. <laughs> uh, I, 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 I'm uh, almost speechless to begin with um, this conversation, hearing all of your accomplishments. Of course, I, I know who you are and I've read all about you and everything, but to meet you now in person is, is really, really an honor because I know what kind of passion and ambition and, and motivation you need to get to where you are today. So, so congratulations before we even start on, on giving me, well, thank you for giving me this opportunity to have uh, some, some time with you to speak with you. I really appreciate that. Thank you, Frank. It's it's absolutely <laughs> mutual. I am uh, I'm really excited to have this conversation, and you know um, I think for me the the really big big attraction of having this opportunity to interact with you is to talk about two of my greatest loves uh, currently because we all evolve, involve we all evolve as human beings as time goes by. So my current love, of <laughs> course, is um, is aviation and electric mobility, right. and I've always been uh, very excited with the possibility of what the electric future holds. Um, I've keenly followed the Formula E race, which unfortunately hasn't, has had a truncated season this year because of COVID. And um, I've seen the massive leaps in technology with, uh, with, the, with the battery size reducing, with the, the range increasing. And you know, I've always wondered that the time isn't far for us to have a full-fledged plane. Uh, in fact, a lot of times at the Formula E uh, sort of sister events, which are part of the main race, you often see a lot of electric offerings. And I actually saw an electric plane prototype, which had managed a flight of seven minutes mm -hmm. in Bern last year, uh, at last, at, at, in the last summer race of uh, Formula E. And, you know, I, I'm absolutely fascinated by what you're doing at Lilia. Tell me something about that. Well, um, <laughs> a lot of it, and, and no pun intended, it, intended, but a lot of it is under the radar at the moment. Uh, sure. in, in the sense that uh, there are many companies actually, not just uh, one or two that are really competing. And it, it's very often times in human history that many things get invented right around the same time that are very similar. So this, this movement has actually been created by the problems that we have today in society and mobility, which are density and, and obviously the, um, pilot error, as we call it, you know, factors that can go wrong that are attributed not to the vehicle itself, but to the people um, operating it. So, um, you know, when we made that change from horses to cars, that was a huge change in mobility and it allowed us to live much further away from wherever we worked. And, uh, you know, the world really started to expand very quickly, uh, range of travel. So I think this new movement from cars to airplanes will be just our EV toll aircraft actually will be just as great as that change that we experienced, you know, in the uh, late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, EV toll aircraft will open up a whole new way of living and, tra and transportation because of the accessibility of it. A lot of people are scared, for example, of, of just newness and change like this because um, it, it's a bit frightening to get into an, e uh, an aircraft that travels you know, in the way these will, it's going to be a bit science fiction for most people when they see it for the first time. But the fact is that these planes are not allowed to fly unless they're extremely safe, much safer than, a, than, than an airplane, for example. And uh, that means that a lot of redundancy issues have to be addressed. In other words, if something fails, you have to have many backup systems. So the first thing I think is to gain the confidence and the trust of, of the people that these are going to be safe ways to travel. And additional benefits obviously will be the speed of getting from one place to the other and, and less extra miles that you have to put in uh, after you arrive at your destination. And they'll, they'll be located in places that you can uh, pretty much land within the city to get to very close to where you wanna go. Um, the other factor, of course, is the, the, the cost of it. And uh, if everything is going as planned as it is uh, currently, and there are a lot of smart people working on this, is that the economics of it will be such that it's actually cheaper to go by one of these types of vehicles than it is to go on land in an Uber, for example. So you will have a cost benefit and you will also have a speed benefit and a safety benefit. And you can't beat that. I mean, that is moving mobility to another level that we don't have today. So it's very exciting. I mean, the whole industry is uh, expecting it to be in uh, 
working in the next three to four years, perhaps. I don't want to give you a very tight deadline, but I can imagine from the speed of development, um, you'll be able to experience one of these on a commercial basis, uh, probably around 2025 um, at the latest, I would say. So many people are like, oh, it won't happen in our lifetime. It's coming very, very soon. It's very exciting. That's, that's, that's amazing. I mean, yeah. I, think, I think the key word here is that it's going to happen in my lifetime. I'm not pretty hung up about whether it is 2025 or 35, but I really would like to see this, to see this happen for yeah. sure. It's going to be fun. It's, it's, uh, the world's our oyster. It takes uh, the crazy ideas of the designers with the intelligent engineers who work together and have that kind of, uh, like I said, passion to turn something that's just an idea into reality. And, 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 and we can do it. There's nothing stopping us. And uh, I can't wait for these to start coming out where you go into the cockpit and you actually smell uh, you have smell because we don't have that in the normal industry. We don't control the smells inside the vehicle. We don't really control the sounds in the vehicle. Um, you can really create an environment inside a vehicle like this that just puts you into another another level of of, of enjoyment of traveling. So um, yeah, it's 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 on its way. The people who are involved in it are realizing that. Uh, this is a new chance to break away from the chains of convention of design and we can really build the world that we want to build. And um, yeah, so I'm, I'm super excited about it. And, uh, you know, I don't like the idea of destroying nature and putting things around us that are machine made. But again, the design of these vehicles, um, at least what I am working on or the uh, couple that I've been involved in, uh, don't look like airplanes. You'd be surprised to look up in the sky and call that an airplane. It's more like a flying fish. Um, the reason behind that is because fish are much more aerodynamic, if you want to call it that way. They're actually more hydrodynamic in shape than birds. They have much more resistance. So if you design a plane to look like a fish, then that plane will be much more efficient than, than what planes currently look like, or even trying to base the design off of a bird's uh, profile or whatever. So you might start to get the feeling when you see the first ones coming out, at least the ones that, like I said, that I've been involved in, look like uh, flying hammerhead sharks that have been mated to the bodies of uh, stingrays, for example. The, f the elegance of a stingray mated with the front head of a hammerhead shark, which has these interesting features on the head that is required. They're not just on there for no reason at all. Hammerhead sharks have these fins for stabilization so you can learn a lot i mean i could get into this quite deeply but uh biomimicry which is getting your influence for design through through nature is is for me a mystery why we don't use it more i mean they have the most intelligent solutions that work in nature so if we can just refer back to how nature solves the problem and we bring that into our you know, everyday design issues, then we can, we can, we can save a lot of work. <laughs> but what actually brings me to another question here is that if it's going to have no uh, aircraft like features, yeah. then the entire training protocols will also be turned on their head because we as pilots are used to uh, a certain camber and that determines our angle of attack and that the angle of attack determines uh, when we stall. Um, sure. And, uh, and the stabilizers determine what, what kind of lateral uh, longitudinal axis we can work on. So mm -hmm. all of this is going to completely change. So you're actually going to be rewriting the way aviation works. Yeah, I mean, if you look at military aircraft and how they operate, a lot of the, uh, you know, the most difficult planes to fly are, are potentially military aircraft because they have yeah, to be absolutely. fragile. And, uh, you know, if, if you put a normal person inside of a, a vehicle or an airplane capable of what, what these level, you know, generation five fighter planes are doing, it's, it's amazing that, you know, a normal pilot, a normal pilot probably wouldn't able to, to control a plane like that. So there are a lot of electronic features that are brought in to stabilize and to control the vehicle, the airplane. And so a lot of the systems that we're talking about in these aircrafts are trying to eliminate pilot error. So it will be controlled. So in other words, there'll be sensors on board that tell you, you know, it depends on the system of propulsion that we're using because some of them are drone type and some of them are inducted fans. So there's no propellers. It's just air being sucked in kind of like a, a jet jet or a turbine type of approach. 
but you can the the airplane can sense you know yaw or changes of direction or whatever and it can compensate by itself you won't need to expect the pilot to make a a, a physical manual action on it it will be sort of like the pilot is more like a controller or somebody there just to to, to, to feel that the, the to make the passengers feel like they're safe <laughs> when right. the less he does the better it is <laughs> so yeah, yeah. So no, we're, 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 they're very aware. I mean, the whole industry is very aware of, of, of these things. But, uh, and again, it's like in the car industry, this movement, this shift that we're having towards autonomous driving and all that, there's certainly a segment of the public that likes that or appreciates it or wants it. Well, yeah. then the public that like to drive, that like to shift the cars, you know, the manual gearboxes, they still want to have that thrill. So you don't want to dilute it too much at the pilot or the driver doesn't have a choice that it's he's forced to actually have to use you know a self-driving vehicle so i i kind of prefer the option where you have a choice so you can either fly the aircraft yourself or it can be flown for you or you can drive the car by yourself or it can be driven uh for you so you have a you have an option i can see a car you know somebody who lives in the city who has a, a nice uh say i wouldn't even call it a high performance vehicle but something that's fun to drive he wouldn't enjoy driving his car to the highway or to the motorway and then from that point on where it gets heavy with traffic just let the car t do the uh, the boring part of the drive so he can actually get his his thrill every day driving to the highway and you know the car takes over and he can rest or do whatever he needs to do <laughs> mm. Interesting. I think we, we're really in for some times that we probably as late persons hadn't imagined. And uh, the inspiration for a lot of those things is as far as, far as we are concerned, who are non, let's say, non-technical people, mm -hmm. uh, looks like that we would be entering the sets of a science fiction movie. To add to what Gul is saying, and Gul, um, I'm sure you meet a lot of young professionals who want to follow your footsteps, and I'm sure you meet a lot of young generation, um, you know, riders and and bikers and and uh, racers and enthusiasts of automotive design. Um, have you seen uh, today the human behavior is changing so rapidly? It's changing because of technology intervention. It's changing because of climate change. It's changing the fact that today's generation is far more evolved and far more tribal to the help of a mouse than all of us on the screen multiplied by 300 times. Um, this passion for design, which used to be in our generation, where do you see get changed? Where do you think gets can adapted um, to tomorrow's generation? In fact, most of them are actually on the virtual reality. Yeah, thing, that's, uh... you know? <clears throat> That's a big concern, I think. Um, you know, it's almost like the newer generation won't realize, slowly will forget the passion, the, the magic that happens in the creative phase of, of design, which um, is slowly turning digital or actually quickly turning digital. And it's becoming much less important to be able to simply transfer your thought to a, a, a clean sheet of paper uh, instantly with a with a with a pencil with a pen you know it's it's turning now to the point where universities are are starting to think that okay the drawing talent or the actual initial uh inspirational idea doesn't need to be done by hand but rather just use a computer <clears throat> because it's much quicker because if you make a mistake you can go back a couple steps and and modify it and then repeat and go forward um they're losing the romance of design, I think. I call it the romance of design simply because there's a there's an emotional value that we're losing to to the creation process. And we lose, especially lose in design where where emotion, emotional attachment is so important. We're losing that that feeling that it's actually done by somebody, by 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 the hand of a, you know, um, done by hand sort of approach. And uh, this huge shift that's going to uh, that's going toward digital modeling, which is fantastic. I, I completely understand digital modeling, 3D modeling, and creating things in a digital manner and visualization in digital manners. 
but the truth is that it would be very difficult to create something of exceptional beauty, of timeless beauty um, it, it, by a machine because you're losing the human touch. And, and that loss of that process is, 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 is regretfully uh, happening in front of our eyes or my eyes at least. I see the, the requirements of certain companies in terms of, okay, let's shorten the creative phase down to the shortest time possible. How can we do that? Because it costs money. So let's just go digital and we can speed the process up. But the problem is design is what sells. And if you start creating fast design, you're going to lose the refinement that I think that only a human eye can, can, can value. I mean, it's, it's true that you could, can get very consistent results with a computer helping you, but design is more about uniqueness, I think, uh, uh, creating the heart and soul to the project, product. And that tends to naturally come out of the designer himself. He's able to, uh, we all try, try to make things perfect and sometimes perfect is too perfect. And we need to add character into these vehicles and computers are very cold and clinical and analytical. So they're, they're losing this, uh, this sensitivity that we all need that, that makes something that's beautiful sometimes has flaws, not imperfection or not bad flaws, but they're, they're considered, um, deviations away from something that's perfect i guess you could say call it that way but uh that is what makes you fall in love with the product and when you start relying too much on the digital approach it it takes it to a point where where you lose the emotion the character the the things that make it interesting it's why we all love wood for example wood when you use wood it is so unique it has its own character it has knots it has scratches it has things in it that sometimes we try to polish out, but we're actually taking away the character of the, of the of the material itself. So in a nutshell, what I'm trying to say is that I really regret this movement. I know it's happening due to our um, progress in, in, in shortening development times and uh, making things uh, financially uh, more viable, but it's a real shame to see that we're losing this this art of the romance of creating design by hand and moving it digitally. And, and, and I think that will tend to commonize design too, because we have design languages all over the world that are representative of that culture. You have you know, Far East design, you have Middle East design, you have Western design. And the moment we all start going digitally is when all our designs are gonna to start to even look more closely related to each other. And again, that's a shame too, because cultural design I think is incredibly important uh, we need to keep that design language interesting, and, and, and I think the only way we can do it is to keep it as separate as possible. And again, computers will only make that even more common. And Going back to what uh, Frank was saying um, in terms of how digitalization has taken the romance out of design, but as an experience, uh, as a person like you who experienced the machine um, and, and, gets imbibed into, and, and it gets absorbed into the machine, um, with the coming generation, how would you add or react to what Frank is saying in, in terms of uh, the design process which we which people have started following today? So and how does it affect you as, as, a, as a rider yourself? Well, well two things, you know, uh, one is as a, uh, from a design standpoint, the resistance to change is normal, right? Everybody expects that they like things a particular way and they don't want to change it and they they will, they will find a way to resist anything that's that's now uh, not not something they're used to. Something that's that's something that's come and challenged the status quo. I'll give an example. Uh, the shift to electric mobility, for instance, had a lot of people say, "Oh, you know, the car's fast, but it doesn't make any sound." Now, really, I mean, what is your interest here? Your interest here is to get from point A to point B efficiently, safely. Uh, or you want a certain sound accompanying it. So, I, so uh, you know, a lot of the folks I interact with, the classic petrol heads, the motor heads, were very resistant to the idea of um, electric mobility because first they were like, oh, it can't go as fast. And when uh, Land Speed Records demon demonstrated that electric mobility is just a shade behind traditional IC powered engines, and just already. The thing is, the IC powered engines have reached where they've reached after millions and millions and millions of dollars and almost five decades of research. And we're at the beginning of electric mobility and we've already reached a space in terms of efficiency. The, the electric uh, 
transmission is already 98% efficient and the most efficient IC engine operates at about 44, 45% efficiency. So there's resistance to that. I mean, no matter how, how, how finer the newer product, you're going to resist it. The other thing about um, design-led approaches is that you have, you have to imagine what circumstances will arise and how you can make the human interface more comfortable. I mean, from an aviation standpoint, which is another place where design comes uh, into, into conversation, and what level of automation can be brought in. I mean, the classic example is the Airbus versus the Boeing uh, story, where Airbus is all about computers and computers deciding what, um, what input to take in terms of um, you know, pressure altitude or, uh, or your angles of attack. And Boeing is more about you know, sort of rudder and stick feel. You know, actually feel the aircraft. Now, uh, as Frank rightly pointed out, in the last couple of years of aircraft incidents, we've seen more incidents on account of pilot error. The machines aren't letting us down. I mean, of course, there is the case of a couple of Airbus crashes where manual over override wasn't allowed and the computer thought it knew better. Uh, and, you know, uh, so that there has been that case and that has since been rectified by Airbus after the crash. I think it was, um, it was a Air France crash on its way to Africa. Now, the thing is, um, so there has to be a space where first you disregard the naysayers and you come, you come at it regardless. And two, then you try and create a future which is uh, catering to everything that makes our lives easier. And that really is the fundamental purpose of design. I mean, aesthetics notwithstanding, the idea is to make uh, life easier for us. And as Frank said, now with, with, when you have air taxis, you can live further away uh, from your place of work in an even bigger house because you can now, uh, you, can, you, can, you can sort of transit that much time in a much, um, that much distance in a much shorter time. I, I, I agree, Gul, I, I certainly do. I think also the important factor is that we're always gaining technology in our products. You know, every, every product becomes a little bit more complicated and complex than the last one. And I think the trick, the, or actually the responsibility and goal is to make that increased complexity simpler to use. In other words, we don't want to make simple objects. You know, you, you, you have a phone today that does so many things that was impossible to imagine, you know, 20 years ago, it was, uh, it, it was impossible to believe that a phone could do what it does today. Yet you look at a phone today and you think there's nothing there. It's so simple. And the content is in it. It's, it's incredibly uh, content rich, but the application, the way you actually get around using that 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 information and that technology, is has been so simplified. And that's what's so genius about it. You know, it's not that it's a boring product. The phones don't look boring. Some people might wonder where what is the next evolution in mobile phone technology in terms of design? How can they make it simpler? Well, don't worry. That the designers have many ideas of how they can make the telephone, the mobile phone, look much cooler than it is. At least I have some ideas. Uh, make it look much more futuristic. But at the same time, what you don't want to do is dumb down the product to make it simple. You want to keep so many comfort options and so many things that you can do with that one product. But you need, and I think it was you know even the past masters uh, was it uh, Da Vinci? I maybe even said that. Uh, the complex part of design is in simplification, you know, adding content, sure, do that, but don't make it so difficult to use that it becomes a chore for, for most people. And, and that's, I think that's the holy grail, as we call it, of design is to introduce more information, more technology, but in a way that it's, it's more simplified than it ever was. That's a, sounds like an op oxymoron, as we call it, but it's, uh, it's, it's the job of every designer to take away rather than to add. Yeah, I think well said, absolutely. The idea is to make it simpler, but yet pack it with all kinds of futuristic mm. possibilities, which we yeah. can't even fathom yet. Possibilities yeah. being the key word here. We don't know what's out there. We don't even know what we may use. Yeah, yeah. But it still has to have that, you know, an interface that is no buttons. I mean, exactly. <laughs> I had no idea we'd see a phone like that 20 years ago when I got my first phone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, if you, if you go, take it back to the extreme, when we actually had to carry the battery with us, Oh yeah, that looked like I don't know. It had it so many buttons on it. It was a giant yeah. brick and a yeah. weapon of, of self-defense. If you look, you could use it. It's like a brick, carry the brick with you. <laughs> but yeah, no, I agree. So it's it's. Uh, I mean, that's why design is such an interesting profession because designers. I've always said designers should never ever be satisfied with their work. You know, you could be proud of it and say, okay, you know, that was the best I could do at that moment but you always have to have a better idea. And that's what makes it so fun is that if you stay on the top of the, uh, it's kind of like doctors who have to keep learning the newest 
newest ways to operate and, 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 and to be successful. So, you know, the moment you stop learning is the moment you should just give up and, you know, like take your boots off and stay home, I guess. But the, the design world changes all the time. There's so many new uh, technologies and materials and processes that are being uh, uh, developed all the time. So that gives you always every new project that you do has to bring something new to it. That's, that's again, one of my deepest uh, beliefs in design is that you just don't design a new product and say it's a new product. It has to bring something better and more efficient to the world than what the last product was. Otherwise, you're, you're just an artist. You're changing the look. You're not really a designer. A designer has to bring in, you know, the looks, of course, because looks sell, but it has to bring in also technology. Without that, it's very superficial, I think. So, so that's why, why technology and art and all that coming together makes the world of design so, so much fun to be in. Frank, I just had one uh, question for you. You know, uh, you know, running a business, you would typically want to have a product or a solution that can be sold in any part of the world. Mm -hmm. And does that actually lead to, you know, the cultural nuances and this and this really emotional aspect of provenance losing its relevance? You know, because you know, to me, uh, the you know, the side profile of every SUV looks the same. I mean, what's with that obsession with you know the little kink at the end, which 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 every SUV designer seems to put in their SUVs now. You know, for example, I you know I can't look at a product. I can't actually look at a Peugeot, at the side profile of a Peugeot 3008, and yeah. actually say it's French anymore. Okay, yeah. it's 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 like it's full of bling, so it's more Chinese. It may also be more Indian than it is French. So so where are we? I mean, you 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 did you did bring up this subject. I think we're actually, you know, taking a lot of steps back just because we are losing the 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 cultural ethos. We're actually losing the cultural touch, and that way there will really be no school of design anymore. It's a it's a pity. I, I completely agree with you. It's a pity that they're losing the cultural, and that's what we said at the beginning. They're not taking the risks. You know, maybe it's because such it's a a, a large. Uh, a, a large financial investment for a company to develop a product that they want to make sure that they sell it to the majority of people. In other words, uh, you know, if all the people like it all the time, then you have a great product. And that makes it gener uh, generally, um, you know, when you have a love it or hate it product, you, you're playing with fire. So they tried to sell high volumes. But again, if you do that when you're, it depends, I would imagine, on the company. If you're a company that sells in high volumes at normal prices and you do that, it is critical. But if you do that at a high end volume, like, uh, or, or sorry, a high end company with low volume, like Rolls Royce or one of the, you know, Ferrari, if you make a car that looks generically nice, you're, you're losing the personality that actually makes that company successful for what it is, you know? You don't want to make a soft drink that tastes like any other soft drink and has no character. So I, I, I've always believed that character and design is extremely important. The more generic it becomes, um, the, less, the less design flavor or long lasting flavor it has. You're, 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 you are playing with fire in, fire in that sense too, because you're, you're risking boredom, uh, non-emotional attachment to the product. Um, but then again, if you take it to the extreme, you say that SUVs are all starting to look look the same. I'd be interested to hear your opinion on the the new t Tesla Cybertruck, which I don't think it looks like uh, anything else. <laughs> uh, what Frank and Avik just pointed out, Gul, as a as a rider and a flyer, uh, when you sit inside the machine, um, how much of that is it? it's influencing you is a German machine or an American machine or a Japanese machine or a French machine or an Indian machine. What do you, when you are in experiencing the ride or a flight, um, does this cultural context bothers you or 
it talks to you? Uh, well, actually, it talks to me. Uh, for me, there is a, a certain, I mean, I, when I see, when I, when I was following this conversation between Avik and Frank, there's a certain design language that the American vehicles tend to have. There's a certain European, German sort of uh, sensibility. Then there's, of course, the, um, the Asian sensibility from whether it's from China or, or Japan or, or Korea. And, you know, I think, um, and all of these different sensibilities have different experiences, as Avik was pointing out. Um, for me, European stuff just is, is sturdy and chunky. And that is actually reflected in its, in its design somewhere. I mean, I don't know, I'm, I'm really breaking this down and dumbing this down from a user's point of view. Um, and I feel, from, even from an aviation standpoint, look at the Russians. I mean, look at how huge the Anatovs are. Those giant, I mean, there's, they're, I mean, they have planes that are as big as the, the Airbus Beluga, which is an absolutely terribly ugly giant plane. Uh, but whale of a plane. proportion and beauty are a thing that designers know best. I mean, I'm as an end user, to be honest, for me, it's really how it feels. And as yeah. an end user, all of it needs to come together, the way it looks on the outside, the way it feels on the inside and how it performs. I don't see design in isolation. I mean, to be honest, I'm not really going to go buy a car or a bike because it just looks good. It's going to feel good. And more importantly, as you know, as a, as a, it's a very interesting term that I remember from um, when I was learning how to ride a horse when I was about six, seven years old. And there isn't an English word for it, but the closest word is coordination. So the instructor would say, have tal male with the horse. And the, the, the closest English word is coordination. So how you feel with the machine. Yeah, at one. At, at that, one. How you, that yeah. feeling. I mean, that to me is really where it all comes together. The external, the, 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 the science and the, the technology under the hood or inside the engine. And then how the whole thing feels in you and the machine, whether it's an aircraft or a motorcycle or a car. It just needs to be one. You need to feel one with the machine. Yeah. Ultimately. Yeah, I mean, very interesting. I mean, if you look at cultural design, for example, let's go to our favorite subject, motorcycles. I would never imagine Royal Enfield trying to design a, a, a copy of a Harley Davidson, for example, or vice versa. You know, a Harley Davidson is a Colt machine. And the moment they stray away from, from a Harley looking like a Harley or sounding like a Harley, they're, they're going into deep water. I know they're going the electric route. Harley is just, you know, you, you know about the electric bike. That's a whole new crowd of Harley owners that would, uh, I mean, not owners, they, they probably don't own Harleys and they're getting interested in Harley Davidson because now they're going away, you know, and doing something that's electric, which is shocking for Harley to do. And, and then, you know, that a Harley is a Harley. And if they ever tried to sway away from there and do something that's more, worldly accepted then their their sales would just plummet i would imagine and you know it's like any other company uh, a ducati for example my favorite brand ducati if they were to try to do something like um well ducati is so unique that they can't they have you know okay the biggest change for me was when i don't know if you know this the dry clutch to the wet clutch you know that sound that uh, yes. Ducati's had you knew a ducati was coming from, you know, from the sound away you could tell it was a ducati and the trellis frame, they had a very specific type of frame for the motorcycles, you could see it. And uh, so, you know, I think it's a shame that when companies start to think in terms of money and profit, short term, it might be good. You know, they can say, okay, we, we brought a new model into the range and look, it's so different and so advanced. This is a, a new language. You'll get people from another part buying into the brand because of that, but long term, they're I think they're shooting themselves in the foot because it just starts commonizing cultural design. And again, that's what I, I don't like. I think we should keep our designs not common, very, very uh, culturally relevant. And that's what makes us like to travel. And, you know, how many times do we go to other countries and, and buy things that we would never go, you know, out of our, you know, we buy them because we're in that country and they're very appealing and we're caught up with the emotion of that country and everything. But you would never go to your local store and pick up, you know, a Russian doll in Delhi or somewhere and say, oh, I, this is, looks great. You would buy it if you were in St. Petersburg or something because, you know, you're, it's, it's that. It's the country. It's got the values in it and everything. So, yeah, again, the, um, 
that commonization of design languages for me is 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 not a good direction to go. I can could, I couldn't I couldn't agree more. I think every, there has to be a unique identity for, for which every brand stands for, for which the brand has its loyal following. And uh, I mean, if you have to do electric, I mean, if Harley has to do electric, they're really going to have to be very very smart about how they do it. Absolutely. I mean, they are doing electric, yeah. but I'm, yeah, I'm, they won't lose. They won't lose the rest. I mean, they have their core, yes. their core, right? So it's the V twin. And they'll keep that. And the sound of Harley, I think they have a patent or a patent on it. And nobody can replicate the sound of a Harley. It's their sound, their voice. So, um... You're very much into fitness, aren't you? Yes, yes. Yeah, because I was following that part. <laughs> I mean, it's... You know how important, I mean, you know, people ask me, why are you so fanatical about fitness? You know, you have other things in your life that they don't understand that fitness is probably the reason why a lot of successful people are happy and successful because they feel good, you know? Yeah. It's diet, it's getting air, it's getting out, and it's pushing your body. Uh, not the switch, sorry, I know we're going from technology. No, but it, I think that's body, really the... But it's I, mental. I, I have... It's that you really hit the nail on the head here, Frank. It's fitness that empowers you to do all the different things that you do. Yeah, it gets to be those things would, energy. would overwhelm you. I mean, Absolutely. you know, when you do a variety of things, it can be stress, overwhelming. stress, pressure. Yes, and, and it just clears your mind Absolutely. and gives you perspective and objectivity like nothing else can possibly give. Oh, and yeah. for me, it's it's now all about sanity. It's no longer about vanity, but it's just the fact that I'm so clear headed and so productive. Yeah. That I don't know anything that can make me that clear headed and that productive. Yeah, I feel like a, like some religious person trying to go out and explain people, you know, the power of religion. And you yeah. think, why do I have to tell anybody this? Just, you know, I'm not trying to convince somebody to join a, a movement. It's just that you're making a huge mistake in your life if you don't include the benefit of fitness into your lifestyle as like brushing your teeth in the morning. It has to be unquestionable. Even when you're sick, you should work yeah. out, at least move. Yeah. Because your body will only thank you later for it. It might be difficult, but because you're sick, but okay, not really sick, but you know, a lot of people are lazy and say, no, oh, tomorrow. No, it can't be like that. You wouldn't, you wouldn't not do certain things in your life. If you had a, you know, you, you, you have to almost take it as a, a regulation, a, a mission in your life to, to do the best you can do to keep your body uh, as, as fit as possible. You can go, I mean, many people go to the extremes, and but that's not good either, obviously, because then you lock out the other sides that are important, your yeah. own family time or, or your own mental relaxation time or whatever. But, but exercise is just one of those ingredients to leave, leading a life that that, that you're satisfied with, you know, and, and satisfied with yourself and you have that energy that is always there, not just, you know, once in a while after I've slept 12 hours, I'll feel good. No, you should always sleep eight hours, always, if not more. <laughs> yeah. So no, I was just curious because I saw that you put a lot of emphasis on it and I, I really believe in that. And it's, it's, I've made it my lifestyle and, you know, it's hard to do it. A lot of us say, well, we don't have the time. Well, <laughs> make the time, <laughs> you know, yeah. it's, Critical. I, I completely echo that. You've literally yeah. said the very same things that I say when someone, someone tells me they don't have time. Why yeah. should they do it? Everything is fine. And yeah. I just don't understand how you can question, how, how you can even possibly question why fitness shouldn't be part of your life. It's like, mm. it's like I said, that's the same example like you're brushing your teeth. And yeah. I think because, I mean, to be honest, I, I honestly, it means a lot to me and every given opportunity, I do talk about it. But mm -hmm. I think it's what fascinates people oh why is she so interested in fitness and I'm always happy to answer that question it's Good. it is the it is the the elixir of everything that you do yes yeah a hundred percent yeah I mean you see it it's very hard to find somebody who's who's practicing fitness and not with it or not feeling well or say feeling low no you know that that is the cure to so many of our yes. our our problems in society today. It takes you know so many people have road rage and stress and you know get irritated so easily. Well, 
that's what exercise is for. <laughs> it's a vent. You use exercise. It helps you, helps your body, helps your mental performance. Uh, and you know, one of the other things that I find extremely important, and, and we all have it, but what the problem is, is that we lose it as we get older and, and we become less of this quality that I'm going to mention to you. And it's a shame because then we become almost a, a, a robber of, of, of space on earth. Uh, of oxygen you know when we're all born how curious we are you know, about things babies are the most curious things around you know they're always touching and experimenting and asking small children they want to know more and more and the parents get frustrated because the child won't stop asking me this that curiosity i think is one aspect that we tend to lose as we get older we become less interested in things less curious about about all aspects of, of, of our universe, life, everything. And so we just start to accept. But if you can keep that curiosity going, the light of the curiosity going, then you're geared towards creativity. You know, many people, I've experienced a lot of companies asking me, can you speak to our teams in, in, a, in a way that uh, makes them understand the value of creativity? And can you fire them up to be more creative? You can't do that without a foundation of curiosity because curiosity is what generates the creativity. Then you, from being curious, you can become creative, but without being curious, there's no real, there's no real platform for, for the creativity to sit on or to, to, to spark off. So <clears throat> I think it's more about stimulating or actually not stimulating, keeping the curiosity fire going as long as possible. You know, it's a shame that kids, have so much of it and then it deadens down or it's discouraged through their lifetime, you know, and they just focus on one thing and shut everything else out of their life and uh, start you know, taking emphasis off of being worldly and learning things. That's, that's, that's one of the things I don't like to see, you know, of, of generations where they're starting to grow and become very focused just on one thing, you know, that's makes life a little bit more dull, I think. You know. Do you, do you agree? <laughs> Absolutely. I think curiosity is the, is the other elixir of life. There's uh, fitness and then yeah. there's curiosity. Yeah. I think for me, uh, you, you, golden words were, you know, what truly really was spoken when you said that everything is fueled by curiosity. And the thing okay. is, we, 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 get, we get comfortable, we get complacent. And I think actually more than complacent, we get comfortable. And mm -hmm. when you get comfortable, you just become lazy you're like oh yeah now it's okay now it doesn't really matter and you know all that um so i think com the comfort factor yeah is what takes away curiosity oh yeah absolutely yeah what is that one that they say Google where it's like the magic happens outside of your comfort zone oh that yeah in your oh, comfort yeah. zone absolutely you, you know people like they go oh you were lucky you know you you were you were lucky to get to where you're at and that. And I said, no, I wasn't lucky. I, I made the most of the situation because a lot of people, like you say, they don't like change. They're, they're, they're okay. They're okay where they're at. And, and, you know, they're not going to drown and they're not going to, you know, uh, be uncomfortable. They're going to be fine the way it is. But <clears throat> at the end of the day, when you look back, I think we have to always envision what we're going to be thinking of ourselves when we're, you know, in our last, uh, last half of our life or decade of our life or whatever, we have to look back and think, okay, I did the best I could. And if you haven't pushed yourself to try new things or to, to put yourself in that uncomfortable position, you're cheating your, yourself, I think. There's so many things that the fear factor keep us from, from trying to do. You know, we're, we're all scared of change. Nobody really, nobody desires change all the time. You want to have a comfort stable le level in your life, but, the fact is, if you stay where you are and you don't really push yourself, at the end of the day, we'll all get restless. You get restless and just become complacent. So I've always tried to, you know, take advantage. There is, I don't believe in luck. I have to say that. You put yourself into a position where good things can happen, and then you have to make the change. You have to make the, the, the movement yourself. So that's, that's what luck is considered. Typically, when you change, things change for the better. It's always hard to see it, I think. From the, from the side before it happens, but when you have that energy to change or to do something that puts you in that discomfort zone, it turns out for the best. Hardly ever have I heard a story where somebody has gone backwards. It feels at the moment that you're going backwards because you don't know. But the moment you have actually pushed yourself through that barrier and accepted that I'm gonna do something that maybe frightens me, 
you come out winning at the end. You always come out winning, I, you know. But you know, on, on, on curiosity, um, I did a presentation a few days back uh, on the difference between epistemic curiosity and perceptual curiosity and, mm. and how when NASA was sending a, a rover to the Mars and they came out with a student competition to name that rover and a nine-year-old uh, student named the rover Curiosity and says, that's because I want to ask a question why and we want to explore. So yeah. yes, I mean, it's, it's, thank you. It's been a pleasure listening to both of you. Uh, Gul and Frank. Anything, any last words from, from both of you, uh, Gul and, and Frank? I'll go first and be really quick. I think for me, it's been fantastic to actually hear someone, um, uh, you know, far more accomplished and uh, with a massive body of work, so renowned, really speak of the very same value system that I, I would like to espouse. Sometimes I succeed and sometimes I fail, but to see a validation of what I think is the way way forward for me has been the greatest uh, takeaway frank i think this for me has been such a fantastic conversation simply because it apart from the automotive design and the general design part because that's really beyond the realm of my um sort of comprehension beyond a point but the oh. basic validation of the value system of of the code of conduct of how we must pursue our lives is what has been the biggest takeaway and i'd love to look you up when i'm in the uk sometime Please do, please do go. I'm sure we would have part two uh, conversation, part three, part four. <laughs> I feel like I could talk to you for many, many, many hours, <laughs> weeks, <laughs> and uh, I hope we get the chance to do that. I, I find you incredibly interesting and and, and mysterious in a, in a in a great way because of the things you've been able to do. And I, you're 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 still hungry, which is fantastic. You know, it's like talking to a child in a way. You know, you have that energy that that few. I mean, you come across it, obviously, in the creative professions, everybody wants to accomplish something new and leave a legacy. But, but um, I, th I believe in the power or in the benefits of basically looking at the world from a really, really wide perspective, you know, not super focused, because it's easy to be super focused and exclude so many other cool, great, cool things in life. But I think the, the great things are done by people who sort of open up their vision and experience world, the world for, 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 for everything that it offers. We learn so much from other professions, you know, um, this, this idea of cross industry um, communication and, and, and work is bringing a lot of new things to design. And so I think, you know, this, this chance to speak with people that do things differently than what we do or, or in different professions is fantastic. So again, thank you guys. I, I really, I, I, I'm, I'm uh, incredibly, uh, I'm feeling really good right now. I haven't spoken with Cole. <laughs>